When you think of Maine seafood, lobster likely comes to mind, but for a brief period of time in the mid-90s, people up and down Maine's coast were after green gold, sea urchins. In fact, sea urchins became the state's second most valuable fishery behind lobster, but then the urchins vanished. Jack Mulmott joins us live in studio. He traveled all over the state to find out what happened, why, and what we can do to save it. Well, Brian and Amanda, in the late 1990s, the Department of Marine Resources put a freeze on all new fishing licenses for urchins, blaming intense overfishing and years of absolutely no regulations. Now, today, that means everyone who still harvests them has to keep renewing their licenses every year. Most of these fishermen, fishermen are in their 60s and 70s, and fishermen I spoke with say they are literally a dying breed. And you can see in the graph behind me right here that where the licenses stopped is also close to where the peak of that graph is. And ever since then, the landings every single year are continuing to dwindle. I met people who still fish for sea urchins in down east Maine, where conditions somewhat resemble what the population of urchins look like in their prime. In the easternmost city in the nation, with some of the earliest sunsets on the east coast, and some of the longest winters. As a trademark fishing port, and despite more than a thousand year-round residents, it has its very own family newspaper, the Quaddy Tides, chronicling fishing today, These are skull crackers. and evidence of an industry that once mm -hmm. raked in more than $20 million, the green sea urchin. But even here you have back in 2000, you know, they were finding them scarce from the bay. Now, a shadow of the industry it once was. The fishermen who remain must adapt. I always wanted to dive, and I always cut wood. I had my own skitter. What you're seeing is an increasingly rare breed of fishing. They were buying, and we went. Got to, back then, anybody could go. There was no safety courses. There was nothing. Paul Cox. He's in his 60s now, but believe it or not, he's one of the youngest sea urchin fishermen left in Maine. So how long have you been doing this? A little over 30 years. This is exactly what Paul does for a living, putting on 30 pounds of metal weight and hurling his body into 34 degree water. His crew waits patiently for his return. I definitely wouldn't want to be the one in the water, you know. His crewmen, Paul and Jevin, who are, by the way, much younger than Paul is, but under Maine's current license laws, only Paul can harvest. To find out what Paul does down there, I decided to brave the near freezing temps. Ready to get in the nice warm water. And dive down about 40 feet. It's under the water where it seems we're frozen in time. The conditions of sea urchins down here resemble the highly profitable time of the 90s. And from the dark ocean sea floor comes Paul with what some fishermen call green gold. Quickly, this unique way of fishing becomes a fast paced system of sorting, cleaning, sizing. It's all hard and freezing work, all for this. And while most of the harvesting these days is done down east, it's in southern Maine where these urchins end up. At ISF Trading Company in Portland, Achan Tamaki shows us his life and claim to fame. So you were the first person to catch the urchin here and send it back to Japan? Yes. In, in 1994 and 95, there's a 60 company processing sea urchin from Maine to New York. How many are there now? Right now, three. And even as the yearly catch for sea urchin has plummeted every single year. <laughs> the first one and the last one. <laughs> my, all my customers said, don't quit. And just a walk downstairs from his office, it's a symphony. <laughs> Elmer Carrias is from Guatemala, one of many workers here who come to Maine for a new life and a new income. I do for uh, 25 years. But for how long will this income last? Um, it is a shadow of what it used to be. I wanted to know why the industry got here, so I spoke with Robin Alden, the commissioner for the Maine Department of Marine Resources from the mid-1990s. Some people who wanted regulation didn't dare say it. She says at that time, the DMR couldn't regulate fisheries until they were already overfished. All those measures didn't allow them to rebuild. And the question is why? The urchins have not come back. Invasive green crabs eat the urchin 
and green algae suffocates the sea urchin's food. And of course, we have warming waters. And once it gets much warmer than that, they don't do well. At the Humane Cooperative Extension in Ellsworth, a man in touch with all forms of aquaculture says something can help. And I see this aquaculture is part of the mix. But Steve Eddy says the state of aquaculture for sea urchin now is hard to meet the demand for an international market. But I do see aquaculture as a way to preserve the industry in Maine, maybe at a smaller scale and, and certainly as an adjunct to the fishery. Back in Eastport, the fishermen make the case for preserving the wild fishery for however long it may last. Put your money in the wild fishery. Yeah. But you're going to see until things come back in a boom, I think we're at our low. If we're not at our low now, there's nothing we can do to bring them back because we've lost the fishermen. And as Paul and his crew cash in at the end of another sea urchin season, they count the cash as well as their days, hoping they won't be the last of a generation lost to the tides of change. In Eastport, Jack Molmut, New Center, Maine. And Steve Eddy at the Humane Cooperative Extension says that it is possible that in the long run, green sea urchins could adapt to our changing ocean. But for now, the future of this industry remains with that aquaculture hope of bringing them into kelp farms and other oyster beds, which are also throughout the coast of Maine right now. Both wild and farming. Mm. All right. Interesting perspective on the yeah. industry. Jack, thanks so much.